Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 10th of June 2020, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. Your host today, Mike Robinson, myself, Brian Gerrish, and we're delighted to be joined by Alex Thompson, bringing us Eastern approaches from the Netherlands. Well, should we be clapping or not? Uh, well, this is the question. So the 5th of, the, of July is the date for one final clap. There's a, an entire campaign that's been set up uh, to deal with this. Uh, Brian will be coming on to that in the not too distant future. But uh, the thing that I wanted to ask is, should we be celebrating the NHS in this way? Uh, and I suggest that we shouldn't. Now, of course, I'm not in any way disparaging any of the work of any of the doctors and the nurses here. What we're really talking about is the NHS in the sense of the policy, the organisation itself and the management, uh, not the people on the coalface. But let's just remind ourselves with the latest uh, excess mortality statistics, uh, obviously the numbers coming back down towards uh, the, uh, the, the uh, average of the last five years, as we would expect. Uh, but if we put the uh, alleged coronavirus deaths on here, uh, we can see a large red area which, well, represent lockdown deaths. Uh, we've covered this before, but uh, we're bringing this up to date. So let's uh, uh, show what we think the actual figure is of lockdown deaths. Uh, if we take the Italian model as an example, where they uh, reviewed their, their coronavirus deaths and decided that 12%, was the 12.5%, uh, sorry, was the, the, the number of, of uh, deaths that were actually attributable to uh, coronavirus rather than those that the headlines suggested were. Uh, and let's put on a, a dotted line here, which shows the date uh, that we entered lockdown in the UK. Um, so the question is, what has caused these lockdown deaths? Um, and uh, well, let's have a look at the policy that the NHS has pushed through. First of all, they Posed blanket do not resuscitate orders. Now there was quite a quite a backlash to that, and they said that those uh, the blanket with uh, DNR order was withdrawn. Uh, I'm not certain that in practice it quite worked that way, but anyway, that's one thing that they did. They uh, returned infected people to care homes, or at least uh, they returned people from hospital to care homes uh, that they didn't know the status of. Many of them were infected. Uh, and that made the situation much worse in care homes. Uh, but alongside the blanket DNR, uh, they of course instructed care homes not to call emergency services uh, if somebody was uh, in the need of it. Uh, and this resulted in many more deaths in care homes. Uh, then of course, uh, within the NHS itself, non-essential surgery was canceled, including cancer surgery and other, I mean, they, they called it non-essential. Was it? I would suggest not. Uh, then, of course, cancer care such as uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy was effectively stopped for many, many people, most people, in fact. Uh, and uh, uh, we saw the results of this in the form of empty wards and empty accident and emergency. And that, and that just to stress that one, Mike, that was reported to us over and over again by people within the NHS from across the country, from nursing um, staff level up to consultant level all saying the same thing that the wards were virtually uh, unused um, and a and e at 30 percent or less uh, absolutely and then finally no proper gp cover now uh, people that we've been speaking to in the last couple of days are saying that finally uh, in the past week uh, they're starting to to have calls coming into gp surgeries that are of the normal types of things that, that uh, that they would expect to receive. Um, they're still not getting face-to-face, -face. nobody's getting face-to-face -face appointments with GPs. It's still remote, um, and, uh, but there has been no proper GP cover over the last number of weeks. So uh, that, Brian, has resulted in deaths. Now the question then, how has the, the BBC covered this? Well, here's this uh, from yesterday, coronavirus weekly death figures continue to fall. So that's good news according to the BBC. They produce a graph similar to, to mine, of course, because it's all based on uh, uh, Office for National Statistics numbers. Uh, but then they, uh, they show this three ways to measure coronavirus deaths. And so they've listed there, they've produced a graphic uh, of deaths with positive test result, death certificate mentions for COVID-19, and deaths over and above the usual number for this time of year. Uh, and uh, well, if you take uh, the first and the last and subtract that, you get 23,111 deaths, which even the BBC acknowledges are unexplained. 
uh, they, uh, so you know, if you assume that's if you assume that the BBC's figures are correct, there are many, many people would dispute those figures because, of course, uh, people that died with coronavirus didn't necessarily die of coronavirus, and we don't actually know what the figures are because there were no uh, postmortems done. Uh, so, but let's just, for the sake of an exercise, take the, their figures. There, they're acknowledging twenty three thousand one hundred and eleven unexplained deaths. Uh, Brian, but there's no question from the BBC about why these non-COVID deaths, excess deaths, have arisen. No, there's no comment from the BBC at all. Um, tens of thousands of elderly people have died, and the BBC doesn't want to doesn't want to do any investigation into that at all. But the other thing on that gra on that uh, on those red bars that you've shown there, the last one, of course ends with the biggest figure. So for the person reading through, particularly if you're doing it quickly, the BBC knows that what is the last number that will stay in your mind, 63,000 over the normal number of deaths. So this is the fear um, promulgation that the BBC is so desperate to continue to go to, to push, even though we know that this virus is over. Yes, now that BBC article quotes this gentleman, Nick Stripe, from the Office for National Statistics, who said that some deaths involving coronavirus in care homes uh, will have brought forward deaths that might have otherwise happened relatively soon. So that's OK then. Uh, but he went on to say this, we might expect deaths not involving COVID in care homes to fall below the five year average in the next few weeks. So although he doesn't actually explicitly say it, or at least the BBC doesn't quote, it, quote him if he did, um, he doesn't explicitly say, but he is implying here, or acknowledging at least, that there are people dying in, in care homes uh, of not of COVID. So they're dying of something else. Why are they dying? This is excess deaths. Why are they dying in care homes? Because they're not getting the medical treatment uh, that they would other, otherwise expect to get. And what he's acknowledging here is that uh, we might, he's saying we might expect deaths not involving COVID in care homes to fall below the five-year average in the next few weeks because over the next few weeks, they will start to receive medical care again as they had before the lockdown. So these are lockdown deaths, Brian, but it doesn't end there because there's going to be a knock-on effect here. Uh, the BBC also reporting that the NHS waiting list could hit 10 million this year. So this is people waiting for treatment through the NHS because the government policy and the NHS management policy has been to completely reorient the NHS towards COVID to the detriment of absolutely everything else. Um, the waiting list could hit 10 million this year. Well, where has this come from? It has come from the uh, NHS Confederation. Now, this is uh, the membership body, <clears throat> excuse me, that brings together and speaks on behalf of the whole NHS. They say they represent over 500 members across health and social care, including hospitals, community and mental health providers, ambulance trusts, independent sector organisations providing NHS care and clinical commissioning groups. Um, and so this is where this information is coming from. Interestingly enough, the number 10 million doesn't appear in this press release, doesn't seem to appear in their actual report either. So that's uh, that figure has it has come from some other briefing. Uh, but anyway, we'll come back to this question. Should we be celebrating the NHS? Well, based on what we've just said, our argument is not in its present form, but here's the danger. The question is what's coming next? And this is probably going to be a theme of this, this program as we work our way through it. What is coming next? Uh, because, of course, the NHS Confederation is pushing this, the NHS reset. So we've got to go back, reset the NHS, do something different with it. Uh, and does that mean uh, moving back to a position that we were maybe in 40, 50 years ago, Brian, where the NHS was actually showing care for people rather well. than just running a sort of industrialised health service? Um, or are we going to head more towards privatisation or some other uh, form of, of so-called healthcare insurance based US style healthcare? Uh, that's, that's the question. But what seems to be happened, what seems to have happened here is that, that the crisis, which everybody acknowledged over the last number of years was there, has been taken to an absolute extreme under yep. the guise of COVID. And here we're going to have a reset and something new come along.
something what's, new and unpleasant. What's that going to be? Yes. Well, Mike, we've we've already reported on this, haven't we? That we've got we've got GCHQ, we've got the Ministry of Defence now involved in the NHS. We are talking about the use of AI. We're talking about massive data sharing. We're going to push vaccines. Uh, there's no doubt that that's going to head towards compulsory vaccinations, which the NHS is going to lead. It must do. So we, we can see where it's going. Perhaps we should bring um, Alex in here for a view on what we've just reported. Well, of course, if you're born in Britain or in several other English speaking countries with the equivalent of the National Health Service, you're not allowed to say anything bad against it, are you? That's the distinctive of Britain and the countries that f follow its lead most closely. I think of the Irish Republic and Canada that have very comparable National Health Service models. Um, it was perhaps born and conceived in, with good intent, the NHS, because you have this post-war Labour government, the prized by a government of uh, Anirin Bevin and Clement Attlee. And what is, what's entered the national ideology about this is that they wanted the care to be free at the point of delivery. So, uh, you know, in, in a good sense, all they wanted the NHS to be was a way of taking care of the bill. So the hospital remained an entity of its own with its own staff procedures and its own care protocols and its own philosophy and so on. That is still the case on the continent where they have the so-called Bismarckian model where you your employer or ultimately the state co-pays with your insurance. You know, so that's uh, that is why we see the Germans. Uh, in the current crisis, pointing the finger at Britain and Ireland and Canada and parts of the US, particularly the cities, and saying you are able to get away with or your, your councils are allowed to get away with massive deaths in care because of the central command that you have, whereas we on the continent don't have that. Something has gone very fundamentally wrong from the outset. Uh, we have over the years covered some uh, documents coming out of the period around 1968 where the thinking is after the NHS, the talk gets going that uh, the NHS is unfundable in perpetuity because of the ratchet of expectations. Each generation regards more and more things as essential care to which they're entitled and that becomes unfundable through general taxation. That's one part of it. But ultimately, the problem I think baked into the NHS from the outset, and we have to say it even if it's considered rude, is that it was um, a managerial model it's even despite the best intentions and, our, and British clinicians, researchers, nurses remain among the best in the world, obviously. Um, from the outset, there was managerial thinking. Look at the other things that came in the same package from the same post-war government. Town and Country Planning Act, British Nationality Act, um, further rec uh, regulation of the ownership of uh, weapons for self-defense. A whole package of things which a lot of uh, people who are vaguely left wing, will, left wing will say, oh, what are you going on about libertarian um, uh, you know, uh, sacred cows, but taken as a package, what they do is say that the government is going to be the monopoly, the Education Act of Rab Butler, Butler being the most famous example from the same government, and of course, European Military Union. All of these are saying the British government in Whitehall and in local government, its subsidiary, is going to regulate and control how you live your life. Now, if you start off with that philosophy, you're going to end up with this kind of deformation. Yeah, and uh, I think we're going to suffer from it unless we do something about it. Well, let's follow on with the clap. But uh, I came in from the BBC website looking also at that NHS waiting list because there it was early this morning on the left hand side. Um, but what caught my eye opposite was the fact that important news from the BBC that zoos and safari parks were going to reopen on the 15th of June. However, I also noticed that when your eye was drawn to the zoos and safari parks, because that's much more important than industry or schools getting properly open, um, what did we have? Well, we had the subliminal NHS and the heart advert. Uh, and, the, and what's that? A, a giraffe. A gir yes, uh, but what's it wearing on its head there, Brian? Well, I think that is, that's a heart, I think, at the is back. It, is it or is it a crown? I'm not sure, but anyway. Well, <laughs> well it, could, it could be, but the NHS is definitely there. And I thought, well, how fascinating that the BBC is here using applied psychology to get that NHS message in front of people. Is this because the BBC views uh, people in the NHS as being zoo animals? I'm going to say probably, possibly, Mike, mm. I'm probably not, but possibly. But one thing for sure, why is there so much focus on the NHS? Because it is a massive employer. 
and it infects the lives of everybody in the country. This is why the concentration on the NHS. If you control the NHS, you are controlling the population. So let's have a look at the clapping. Uh, this was the Express a couple of days ago. Uh, clap for our carers. How long does the clap last? Uh, Clap for Carers is a campaign where people can thank the NHS workers and others who've been on the front line for Britain's fight against coronavirus. Now, I think it's significant that the Express knows that in that headline, they're really taking the mickey out of people, aren't they? Because mm. there's the double entendre of what the clap means. And um, we could ask, why would somebody choose uh, to have a a support initiative for the NHS, which was going to be based on the clap. I think we might understand that when we look at the lady behind it. Here she is, Anne Marie Plass. Now she's actually Dutch. Um, she married a British man. That's all we know from the newspapers, excuse me. <clears throat> so she comes into this country. She hasn't lived here that long. She lives in Brixton up in London. Um, but as we will see in a minute, she decided that she'd seen support for the care system in Holland and that it was a good idea and she should bring it into UK. But what do we really know about her? Not a lot. But I'm going to say because she's Dutch, I can accept that she wouldn't have picked up on the double entendre. She would have just picked up clapping and she wouldn't have understood that actually this has got a da dangerous double meaning of a sexually transmitted disease, in case there's any of our audience uh, this afternoon who, who are not aware, excuse me. So <clears throat> where does it lead to? Well, it leads to this website, uh, and this is where most of the information that she's putting out appears. Excuse me, just a quick drink of water there. But what is fascinating is that you can't get in contact with her directly. If you go to contact, top right, you're asked to fill in a box. And this is normally the way of formal government orientated type sites. But we'll say, OK, we can overlook that. But if we go to the press button, well, we're in for quite a surprise because basically we can see that this Dutch lady who's appeared out of nowhere is now supported by virtually all the bigger press and media there is. Um, and if you go to BBC, that BBC button takes you initially to the first report on Anne-Marie Plass herself. So a lady comes out of nowhere and starts a massive campaign. Who is she? Well, here she is in the mirror. And let's have a look at some of the things she says. What I've seen in my home country made me look a little deeper into it. And I saw the boost that it gave to the front line and the togetherness it brought to the people that were stuck in their homes. The front line is doing their best they can, being exposed to the virus. We are safe at home and, of course, finding that challenging, but no way as hard as they're doing. And I want them to know that we are behind them and feel so grateful of them doing that for us. So I've got some more comment from her, but Alex, can I just ask you here? She's saying that this sort of thing has been done in Holland. Um, I haven't seen any reports from, from Holland about this as a massive campaign. You're living in Holland. Have you heard about it in any way? No, Brian, although I do try to stand up, stay away from the kind of populist news to keep my blood pressure down. But if there had been a big campaign, I would have heard about it. I'm fairly safe in saying uh, what you were talking about in the introduction. Of course, you also lived in the Netherlands for a couple of years and uh, Mike did at some point as well. You both will agree with me. The Dutch, we are often thought of by both the Dutch and the British. They're often thought of as very similar nations, certainly in European or world terms. And indeed, in many ways, they are. And they have borrowed from each other's ideas for a long time. But of course, it's when we get minor differences that this kind of cultural jarring goes on because the Dutch and British often assume that each other's ideas will fly in each other's societies. And no, they will not. The Dutch have an extremely high threshold before they will start to find something corny. They don't do sarcasm in the way that the British do or, or irony. Their humour is much more and their whole culture is much more visually expressed. So standing up and furiously applauding at the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam as soon as the conductor has basically picked up his baton is how the Dutch are. You know, pr prolonged stormy applause is, is nothing out of the ordinary in Dutch society. So I will grant uh, Madame Plus that looking at her background, 
um, I'm not at all meaning to disparage her here, but I look at the LinkedIn profile that she has. She started off with a polytechnic qualification in fashion and technology, 2000 to 2004. Then she went to Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences and did a bachelor's in law. Well done to her for that. Then in Holland University of Applied Sciences, a very new conglomeration of polytechnics in the Amsterdam and Rotterdam area to do a bachelor's in general communication. Then she's a yoga teacher in Vinyasa Yoga in 2016. So there's nothing here for the years 2010 to 2015. Uh, oh, yes, there is. She goes into the workplace. She's a digital and communications consultant in the in the Amsterdam area for 2012 to 2015 and before that with Zenith Optimedia a senior digital planner for five years ending to 2012 so she's getting into the brainstorming world and then comes the clap for our carers when she's in London as of March this year she's also been a regional sales director for a, a last half a year with someone called objective partners in london so yeah this this profile is one that i often find as a translator of uh, dutch material you know people who who come up with initiatives and want them translated into english will come to me or someone like me and what they often fail to take into account is that there's a lot of cynicism among the brits and their good intent will be twisted and certainly if i look at the website you've just shown I don't believe, even with uh, Anna Marie Plas's past experience in communication, that that website is her own production. I think somebody has taken her for a ride. Well, that's a very interesting comment because um, I think we're going to head in that direction. Let's just follow through with some more of her quotes. Now, I've used the mirror, but the, this quote here is from the Express and the Star. Firstly, she's back on the subject to being inspired in her own country. Then she says, so I posted it on social media and in WhatsApp, sending it to my contacts here in the UK. And within 24 hours, some of the major celebs had it on their page, the Sussex Royals and Victoria Beckham. And I find this fascinating, Mike, that you just throw an idea out there and the next minute you've got the great and the good on board. But she goes on. She says, I think it's good to have the last of the series next Thursday because to have the most impact, I think it's good to stop it at its peak. So she's saying she thinks it's good to stop the clap while it's got to the peak. Um, then she says this, without getting too political, I share some of the opinions that some people have about it being politicized. I think the narrative is starting to change and I don't want the clap to be negative. Now, both of us are smiling as we go through this, but I think this lady is trying to say something. Now, she knows that the government's jumped on the bandwagon. Let's put it that way. And here she's declaring quite openly that she's becoming a bit uneasy about where this is going. But let's follow on. She says in The Guardian here, 28th of May should be the last weekly clap for carers, but the Sunday, the 5th of July, the 72nd birthday of the NHS, marked a chance for the public to expand their gratitude to everyone who'd helped during the crisis. So she's pro the event on the 5th of July, but she's expressed some concern. So Let's look at this Guardian article here, calling for the final national clap on the NHS's birthday. And we've suddenly got a campaign dubbed together, forward slash together. This will be a moment to come together and thank all of those who are helping us get through this ongoing crisis. And then it says something interesting. The civil society initiative is independent of government but is endorsed by the head of the NHS, Sir Simon Stevens. It also aims to cement the increasing sense of community spirit that has developed during the crisis. Now, I think this is suspicious language, but this really adds to it. Research for the Together campaign found that the public felt more connected to their neighbours than before the crisis. A poll found that 60% agreed the public response to coronavirus had shown the unity of our society more than its divide. So my question is, who actually wants to know how well the public is connected? Uh, can't be this Dutch lady who's just come up with the idea of clapping. Now we've got the head of the NHS involved and now we're suddenly carrying out surveys. I don't know who paid for those. But where did this lead? Well, it led through as far as the word together is concerned, to NHS charities together. 
a very impressive image here who cares for the nhs heroes you can how by donating us money and if people care to go to this website you'll be amazed at the number of charities that are collecting money for the nhs and working together um, they're dealing with a mere 123 million pounds so this is big business is now suddenly in here somewhere um, where are we well if we have a look at what they have to say they're joining the call for everyone to get together for the nhs's birthday on july the 5th so they're definitely involved but uh, this is where it gets interesting the nhs has been working with the newly founded together coalition to build a national moment where we can thank everyone who's helped them and one that aims to reinforce the social connections we will need to get through the next stage of the crisis mm. so um, very interesting what's coming and what are they talking about a minute silence on the evening of july the 4th when people will be asked to light a candle in their window in remembrance of all who've died and a moment of thanks and connection on july the 5th when we can take part in one last countrywide clap of thanks and then stay out to raise a glass or have a cup of tea with our neighbors but of course we won't be able to stay out because we're still locked down effectively or we'll be trying to drink through a mask um, but what is actually going on here what's the next stage of the crisis it's clearly not normality and to finish this section when you look at who's involved well here they are we've got sir simon stevens nhs england chief executive the chief nursing officer and uh, the most reverend justin welby who's actually chair, chair of the steering group so is this the coalition they're talking about or is this one part of the coalition but now we've got members of the government involved because we've got uh, dame catherine granger and Baroness Dorian Lawrence well members of the Lords but of course we've now got a higher level Gary Lineker's in there we've got Tim Peake the astronaut I believe at the bottom um, but what is this who are these people and is this really the top priority for an NHS with a 10 million waiting list I think we'd probably say not and I'm just going to leave our viewers and listeners with this one to say, well, have we got the government's behavioural insights team in here? And is this a psyop to actually brainwash people into this almost religious um, reverence to the NHS? Mm. Uh, particularly the lighting the candle the night before. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. L lighting the candle and the minute silence. This is serious stuff. This is wars. This is remembering the war dead. I believe that this is playing with the nation's minds and of course while the nation's minds are on that possibly safari parks they're not looking at the restructuring of government Alex yes well um, it's possible that the candle lighting idea itself came from Anna Marie plus in which case we would cut her some more slack because that kind of demonstrative gesture is ten a penny in the Netherlands and doesn't have the kind of um, uh, war commemoration overturns that it would have in Britain or Finland, for example, where you only light a candle in the window for Independence Day every year. Um, but it could just as well have come from some British members of that steering group. You mentioned there Gary Lineker. Well, someone in the chat box has just reminded us that a couple of years ago when the Brexit vote went the way that Gary Lineker didn't want, he said that those who voted to leave the European Union would be dead before the country left. Uh, was that uh, a prophecy or a threat? yeah Good fascinating yes. fascinating um okay now if you like what the uh, uk column does you'd like to support us then please head over to uh, ukcolumn.org forward slash community there are options there for you to do that uh, and then uh just another quick reminder that if you want to write to david noakes uh, he is in hmp exeter that's 30 new north road exeter ex44 ex and his prison number is a7081 dy now uh, this article was sent to me yesterday and uh, I was fascinated in it. Scientists call for academic shutdown in support of black lives. This is from Gizmodo uh, and uh, incredible story. Uh, they're calling for uh, academia to stop uh, in order to uh, uh, show support. Uh, but it was this, uh, this quote here that really grabbed me. Uh, Discrimination against black scientists rears its head in more insidious ways too. 
Labs will still refer to various pairs of equipment as master and slave, while the most commonly discussed milestone in quantum computing is quantum supremacy. And I really thought that I wondered whether this paragraph had come from from The Onion or some other satirical uh, news website, because this is just unbelievable uh, that, that there's some uh, correlation trying trying to be drawn between uh, terms that have been used for decades on uh, tech for technology uh, as some kind of direct attack against black scientists. This is complete nonsense. It's being pushed into people's minds. But the thing that really grabbed me about this is all the all the focus on historic slavery. Brian, uh, this is starting to uh, which has of, come out of nowhere. It, well, it has come out of nowhere, but it's it's all the focus on historic slavery. What about slavery that is taking place today? We have covered this extensively on this program. I want to just remind everybody what the situation is with this. So here is uh, Sajid Javid, who was Home Secretary at the time when he made this statement. Obviously, uh, not that uh, in that role anymore. Uh, and he said at the time, the impact of modern slavery is huge, both in human lives and our economy, with estimates putting its cost to the UK as much as £4.3 billion in 2016 and 2017. And there was a report came out at the time that this was uh, that he made this statement. Uh, this, this is it, 2018 UK annual report on modern slavery. This is the most recent one that I've seen. Uh, and they were saying the total direct government spend on modern slavery has increased year on year, estimated at around 39 million in 2017-2018 and 61 million in 2018-2019. Now, this is, this is very key because the point that we were making at the time, uh, and we'll make it again now, is that modern slavery is a business, it's an industry, and it's, what's happening here is very much a similar business model to, for example, uh, the, the illicit drugs trade, uh, where the government claims to be spending relatively small amounts of money uh, to stop the trade going on, uh, but in fact, they're giving implicit consent by only spending amounts of money uh, of this kind of scale when compared with the scale of the problem itself. So let's move on with this. Uh, they're talking about, they're saying that Im improving the evidence about the scale and nature of modern slavery is a priority for the UK. Well, it's such a priority that it's not being discussed at the moment today, because at the moment we're totally focused on historic slavery. We're not worrying about what's going on today. And there has been uh, no publicized update to this uh, report. I mean, I'm sure it, it says it's an annual report, but I don't uh, recall seeing anything in 2019 or uh, so far in 2020 on it uh, in the media. But anyway, uh, so what are they talking about? Prosecuting and disrupting individuals and groups responsible for modern slavery, preventing people from engaging in modern slavery, strengthening safeguards against modern slavery by protecting vulnerable people from exploitation and increasing awareness of and resilience against this crime reducing the harm caused by modern slavery through improved victim identification and enhanced support. But correct me if I'm wrong, it's only a couple of weeks since Nigel Farage was in the middle of the, the English Channel videoing people being trafficked from the continent to the UK, having originally come from sub-Saharan Africa, probably, or, or the Middle East. Uh, and what are they coming to the UK for? They're being brought into these types of modern slavery networks. And what was Nigel Farage making the point? He was making the point that the French government, the French Navy, was performing Helping. a handoff to the British Navy to help these people get across the channel. So the British government, I allege, are uh, in fact assisting this process. Uh, this report then uh, provided a little bit of information and just showing uh, the number of adults uh, in between you know the percentage between labor uh, slavery and sexual slavery and also the percentage of children involved in each of these areas uh, a huge amount of uh, number of people that come into this country trafficked into this country end up in sexual slavery including children but we're not hearing anything about any of that at the moment so let's just put this graphic on screen every year human traffickers make a profit from the trade to the tune of 130 billion pounds in the UK there are 21 million victims of modern slavery uh, worldwide. 54% end up in sexual exploitation, 38% in forced labor, 8% uh, other forms of uh, modern slavery, including forced removal of organs. Um, and this is not being discussed under the present circumstances, Brian. And I think the uh, discussion needs to be changed from, as we're gonna come on to in a second, pulling down of uh, 
of statues for, for historic yeah, statues to the, reality. to the reality of the modern world and doing something about this. Yeah. Um, Alex, have you got any thoughts on that? Only to say that this business model was well known in poor countries quite some years ago. I remember vividly being in a church service in the former Soviet Union in the year 2000 and a man addressing the church after the service and saying, don't get on the uh, truck as it would have been in those days to go to London or Germany. Uh, because you'll be offered jobs and those jobs will not be there and you will end up in uh, prostitution and worse. So you know, this, is, this is known to people with very little education in, in what was then a very poor country. Uh, so why is it not known to the government and more particularly the broadcasting class? Well, it seems to be at the, you know, the best that this is an area where polite people have come to some kind of compact not to speak about it. Sometimes there's very woolly thinking in there that if we speak about it, it will be racially or religiously offensive or will fan the flames of intercommunal strife. Uh, but keeping silent about it surely ain't going to solve the problem, is it? Uh, no, it isn't. Now, uh, we've been talking about the lockdown. The question is, uh, what, what was it brought about the lockdown? This is something that we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and got a bit of a tip off or at least a, a reminder uh, over the last couple of days uh, about looking in a particular direction. So, so let's do that because, you know, if we're talking about lockdown deaths earlier in the program, that, and if we remember back to the, the, the days, the, the couple of weeks running up to the lockdown, of course, Boris was attempting to pursue a very different policy. So where did the policy of lockdown come from? Uh, well, if we go to the sun here from, uh, this is from February, the 27th of February, uh, this was the headline, deadly coronavirus could infect 80% of Brits and kill 500,000 people in a worst case scenario document reveals. And this was a document which was allegedly leaked, uh, a memo. Uh, and the question is, where did it come from? Well, the Independent tells us they were covering the same issues, citing the Sun uh, and saying the document came from the National Security Communications team. Well, the question is, what is the National Security Communications team, that's the NSCT. Uh, let's just have a, a quick look. Um, well, here's uh, PR Week, and they uh, were speaking about this in May 2018. Uh, government boosts national security comms capability to combat international threats. Uh, so this was, in fact, all about disinformation. It was really directed at that point towards the Russians, uh, but it was really concerned about fake news and disinformation, uh, and uh, that's really what we can say about it. Uh, it was also mentioned uh, in this document, the Government Communication Plan 2019-2020. This is all apparently, Brian, about strengthening our democracy. And of course, the biggest thing about it is tackling misinformation and disinformation. Uh, and uh, well, in this document, they say that the NSCT will increase public resilience to disinformation. So why is a, 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 an organization there which is supposedly uh, dealing with disinformation maybe running fact checking or offering corrections to information. Why are they con uh, producing memos about the number of people that are going to die in the uh, as a result of COVID-19? I don't have an answer to that. I don't know whether these people, whether the NSCT had been in communication with, with uh, Mr. Ferguson, for example, Professor Ferguson. Uh, but nonetheless, this memo that the mainstream media uh, was uh, talking about had come from this organization. So where did that come from? Well, it came from the government's efforts to control the narrative, uh, which really began in early 2018. Uh, and so in March 2018, we had the National Security Capability Review, which was published, I think, in March. Yeah, sorry, in March 2018. And that established the fusion doctrine, which we've discussed quite a bit on this program in the last couple of weeks. And it also established the National Security Communications team. Uh, then in April 2018, the Rapid Response Unit in the Cabinet Office was set up. Uh, and this, again, is there to deal with uh, disinformation and misinformation. So we're, it's amazing how many groups are being set up to deal with that. Uh, and then in July that year, we had the Rapid Response Mechanism set up. Uh, and this is not anything to do with the Cabinet Office. This was where Theresa May had gone to the G7 and convinced all the G7 countries that the best thing to do would be for everybody to agree a common narrative based on a common purpose and make sure that that common narrative was pushed out through all national media. Uh, so this is all about control of the narrative. Now, we've shown you this uh, diagram over the last couple of weeks. 
uh, Mark Sedwell there, who is uh, head of the civil service. He's also head of the cabinet office. He's also national security advisor, therefore head of the National Security Council, ultimately in control of all the uh, uh, various intelligence agencies, GCHQ, Security Service, Secret Intelligence Service, and the new Joint Biosecurity Center. Um, but of course, he is also therefore, as by dint of being in charge of the cabinet office, in charge of the rapid response unit. He's in charge of the national security communications team and therefore indirectly in charge of uh, 77th Brigade and the new 13th Signals. So we've got this nice little nest of vipers here set up to try to control the narrative. Uh, but if we just put this in a little bit of uh, a slightly different context here, uh, as since he is in control of the national security communications team and the national security communications team seems to have been pushing out the material which the mainstream media have used to push for the lockdown. Uh, so he's used the mainstream media to do that. Uh, the mainstream media has then, that's resulted in pressure from the public on Boris Johnson to change his policy. And of course, pressure has been coming from Mark Sedwell as well to put pressure on Boris Johnson to change his policy. I'm putting the responsibility for the lockdown and therefore the responsibility for all the deaths as a result of lockdown at the feet of Mark Sedwell. Uh, he is Mr. Lockdown. And uh, we've got to again ask this, why this man has this unprecedented level of control and power in this country, Alex, because this is the first time in history that we've had all these branches of government in the hands of one man. Yes, Mike, and there are no counterbalances to it now because the cabinet office or certain subcommittees of it where Mr. Sedwell floats around are actually unchecked and, and unbalanced now. Um, there used to be a much more personal, vigorous exercise of crown prerogative by the Queen or by the Prime Minister, and that has now been spun out into what you could call a corporate crown. The basic, uh, the final decisions on what is just what is constitutional no longer take place in broad-based institutions, but increasingly the final backstop is the cabinet office for many of these models. Um, an entity which we should perhaps bring into this dialogue is the Privy Council. It's often not uh, uh, reckoned with that the cabinet itself is, it's often thought of as a, a committee of ministers that comes out of parliament or has its base in parliament. Well, they're drawn from parliament in the Westminster model, the better to convince us that we have representative government. But no, at law, the uh, cabinet, as in cabinet office, which is the civil servants for them, um, is a, a, an executive subcommittee of the Privy Council, around 800 people sworn to secrecy and to do the monarch's bidding in a not very, not very constitutional or common law way. Uh, likewise, the old law lords, now the Supreme Court, is a judicial subcommittee of the Privy Council. The separation of powers breaks down at that point. When you get to the, the, the ring of people around the crown, who now call themselves the crown, they're corporate, they're a corporate crown, they don't have a judicial branch, an executive branch, and a legislative branch anymore, or separate separation between civil service and ministers. It's just, we are the crowd around the Queen. All your uh, justice, your law, uh, your policy comes via us, right? So the way into that bubble is through Mr. Sedwell. So that's why he has amalgamated everything together. But that is not to say that he's running the policy. He's occupying what we at UK Column now call the throne. He's King Mark on the throne. But who crowned him? It wasn't the Archbishop of Canterbury. Yeah, good question. Well, indeed, good question. A lot of questions got to be asked. Yes. And uh, this, of course, is uh, being shown widely over the media at the moment. We are taking down statues. Um, a lot of reports, including Voice of America here, reporting what's, uh, what's happening in UK. But report after report that suddenly somebody's taken it into their heads that they're going to get rid of statues because um, they're connected to slavery or racist behaviour, whatever it is. No debate in Parliament at all. But what's actually going on here is national history being destroyed. Classic example in Plymouth. Um, we've got Drake on the hoe. And Drake used to have quite a comprehensive plaque with him describing the Spanish Armada. The plaque disappeared. I don't think it's going to be long before that statue is going to go. But no formal debate over this. So we've now got chaos and anarchy breaking loose in the country, supported by local authorities. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Um, okay, so today is the final day of COGX. This is the Global Leadership Summit and Festival of AI and Emerging Technology. Now, we have highlighted the fact over the last few weeks that uh, the fourth industrial revolution uh, is absolutely the direction that we're heading in as a result of COVID-19 and the uh, decimation of our economy uh, that followed. Um, so this is a very interesting uh, event. Uh, let's uh, have a look and see what they're talking about. Uh, this year's COGX event will be the biggest, most inclusive and forward-thinking online gathering of leaders, CEOs, entrepreneurs, scientists, artists and activists in the world, all trying to answer the question, how to get the next 10 years right. So this is very important. Keep that in your mind, how to get the next 10 years right. Uh, who's speaking at it? Everybody from Anne Applebaum uh, to John Kerry, uh, all kinds of people here. And of course, uh, there's Tony Blair, uh, because of course, he's all about global change. Um, and uh, these are the, the types of things that they're talking about, global leadership, ethics and society, uh, health, well-being and COVID-19, apparently, uh, and so on. OK, but remember, this is all about getting the next 10 years right. Um, so uh, uh, here is uh, NATO. And uh, you might be wondering why we're talking about NATO all of a sudden, uh, because NATO has launched their NATO 2030 initiative uh, to much fanfare yesterday. Um, and uh, well, what is uh, Jens Stoltenberg saying about it, aside from all for one and one for all and all this kind of typical NATO nonsense? Uh, well, here he is. Uh, and what he said is NATO 2030 is an opportunity to reflect on where we see our alliance 10 years from now, from now and how it will continue to keep us safe in a more uncertain world. And it just fascinates me, Brian, whenever we see these types of things uh, reflecting the same language and the same narrative. Yeah, uh, carrying on in parallel. Absolutely, apparently, parallel. apparently yeah. disparate things. But anyway, what's he talking about? Uh, well, he's saying we must resist the temptation of national solutions and we must live up to our values of freedom, democracy and the rule of law. Well, we can just presume that he's lying at that point because I haven't seen any evidence uh, of NATO actually providing any of those things. But anyway, uh, maybe Alex has got some thoughts on that. Uh, he said that uh, using NATO mo more politically also means a broader range of tools, military and non-military, economic and diplomatic. He's very, very keen to see NATO become uh, a much more political animal. Uh, but uh, he is also very keen that China is not the enemy, the new enemy, but actually it is. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. Now, so what, what is NATO 2030 all about? Well, it's a shift in uh, centre from Europe to more global Australia, New Zealand, Japan and South Korea. So if we're uh, saying that China is not the enemy, but actually, actually China is becoming much more dangerous and so on. So really it is the enemy. He is reflecting a shift in policy for NATO from a European position to a more global position. He's wanting to get very, very close to Australia, New Zealand, Japan and South Korea, not only therefore to encircle Russia, Alex, but to encircle China as well. And this is not a good development, in my opinion. But the question, the question is, we've got the, uh, the NATO defence ministers meeting next week and also the EU foreign ministers meeting on defence next week. Is this a sign not only that NATO wants to uh, adjust who the enemy is to include China, but also perhaps that maybe we're seeing slight dividing of the ways with the EU itself? I would say so, Mike, because the NATO and EU um, collaboration is going to hit uh, a rock at some point if things don't change, because NATO is predicated upon international treaty-based agreement nations retain their sovereignty, although Mr. Stoltenberg is now pouring cold scorn on sovereignty and national solutions, as you say, whereas the EU, formerly the European communities, uh, is predicated upon supranational government. You get your orders directly from above the national government without them vetoing or agreeing it. And so if NATO wants to move towards one for all and all for one, as it now seems to be doing, uh, or even now pretty much ordering the Americans to think twice about pulling half their troops out of Germany, which was another theme of Mr. Stoltenberg's speech yesterday, then in analytical legal terms, what's going on is NATO is wishing to transform itself from an international treaty-based organization to a supra, supra-national government, uh, like the EU is. 
which of course in the EU itself is almost foundering now, floundering now because of the, uh, the amount of resistance that that's meeting. So ultimately there is going to have to be some crunch point and if NATO wishes to become effectively um, a supranational model, it's going to have to decide uh, which of the flavours it is, a unitary state like Britain when we had the Union of the Crowns, or a confederation like the United States, or a federation like uh, Germany or the European Union. So it's it's moving towards being a government for its countries, isn't it? Which just again underlines that when you merge your defence commitments and have an Article 5 undertaking to defend each other, that's not just all hunky-dory, that also involves harmonisation of policy, defence procurement and taxation. And people on the other side of the equation are making an absolute killing out of the defence contracts for that. So a lot is at stake when you agree an alliance. Uh, and just to, just to briefly end on this, Alex, what, what are your thoughts on, on this encirclement of China? Um, it, it really is not, it, to, to me, it just doesn't seem like a sensible development. No, it's, it's never worked in history. Um, Russia has been used to encirclement in a way Germany has been as well. And uh, Britain and France avoided it somehow, somehow because they were more maritime uh, superpowers. But China, of course, has always you know, had this interesting situation of being effectively uh, landlocked uh, because of the mountains and deserts around its northern, western, southern fringes, jungles. And its only real outlet heretofore has been through the China Sea. And now there's this blockade and or effectively lining up for a blockade, the nine dot dash line to keep uh, China uh, either blockaded or from the Chinese view, uh, keep the sea lanes open. So there's a lot of contention about that. The new uh, dynamic in this, of course, is that overland routes have opened up to trade and also to moving troops and equipment out overland. So attempting to encircle China is, I think, going to end badly uh, because the dynamics are totally different. It's a 19th century doctrine which is facing up against 21st century technology. Mm. Yes. OK, thanks for that. Well, I think we're at uh, the end of today's news. So we thank our viewers and listeners for joining us. Thank you, Alex, for joining us as well. A lot of complex things there. There's a lot of chaos and confusion in UK at the moment. We're going to say to our viewers and listeners to look through what we're going to call the dross. So while people are occupied on face mask time, not going out, not being allowed out of their houses, uh, the importance of safari parks being opened. My goodness, that's one of the most important pieces of news mm. that we've had. Uh, while you're focused on that, you're not looking at what the deep state is doing in UK and the deep state is dismantling our constitution and law very quickly indeed. It can be stopped, but it requires enough people to be focused and answering the questions. Research what we've given you today and uh, we'll be back at the same time on Friday. Bye-bye.